Hi, my name is Jeff Pagano, and welcome to Harping on Rugby. This is the Front Five, part of our weekly 80-plus column, where we harp on a selection of eye-catching, egg-chasing quotes and links from around the rugby media landscape. Now, in case you missed it, check out our rap pod first uh, from uh, the big match at Croker last weekend. David Cordell and uh, Hugo Gordon did an excellent job of summarizing the 26-12 win. You'll find that on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all the other usual platforms. We also had an extra chat on the Emerging Ireland Tour. You'll find that one back on the YouTube channel. And you'll get it with the full 80-plus column, including the front five links I'm about to harp on, plus all our other usual features like Leinster Squad Update, Troll Patrol, as well as a roundup of all the other major competitions in the world of rugby. That's all to be found on our website at Harpin on Rugby. Dot blog. But for now, it's all about our front five. As you can see there, I've got five headings lined up here. So let's crack on with this week's article, starting with this one from World Rugby, the, the main World Rugby website. The uh, headline reads, Rankings Confirmed for Women's Rugby World Cup 2025 Draw. Now, as you like I said, there was a big game in Croke Park last weekend, and that kind of took up all the, the, the rugby chess. Um, but I think it's very important to remember what happened the very night before. Uh, fr- it was Friday evening. We were watching uh, the game. There was a game in Vancouver between uh, the Irish women's test team and the USA. It was in the WXV1, the top tier tournament of uh, this new competition for women's rugby. Uh, Ireland qualified for the top tier. They had an amazing win over New Zealand three weeks ago. Now they fell to the host Canada last weekend, but they were still competitive in the competition going into the final round. And they had this incredible win in their third and final match over the USA. And this led to a second place finish in this competition. I mean, that is incredible. Whatever you want to say about how the competition structured, they didn't play England. They didn't play France. That's nothing got to do with it. They finished second in this tournament. And um, that's just incredible when you consider all that's been going on in women's rugby. And uh, this win over USA did not come easy. Uh, The scoreline was very similar to what happened in Croke Park. I think it was 26-14 the women won by. They were behind a couple of times. The USA had a really strong first half, but Ireland just, they, they soaked up the pressure and they came out strong in the second half and and uh, ended up with the win and it was an amazing um uh, performance over the three matches including um a win over the um australia before that and then going back uh, further to the six nations um where they had a strong third place finish there as well it's been an incredible year for this irish team especially when you see where they were four years ago not qualifying for the last world cup it's it's incredible and we've talked a lot about Eva wafer um how she's been world class and she's this big find she's 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 crashed her way onto the world stage uh with her performances but it's not all about her it's the team there's a lot of other performers in the team there's aaron king who's been scoring tries Kleena maloney has done well um coming back into the team but it's 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 almost unfair to name those players because it's the team effort and it's the coaching and it's the way they play with such belief that is amazing to see and i just It was just the timing of it. On Friday night, they had this incredible win, this incredible result to cap off an incredible year. And then, of course, the whole Irish rugby world turns their attention to Croke Park. And there's 80,000 people there. Big occasion in its own right. And it's almost forgotten. So let's not forget that this women's team and what they've achieved. And that's why I wanted to put them first, the first Front 5 article. And uh, actually, going back to this article, this is about the seedings for next year's World Cup. So next year, you're going to have... The Six Nations, where we want to build on um, uh, the success from this year. Now, we finished third last time. No guarantees we're going to finish higher this time. There's still England and France. We still could be a far, long way off them. But we can definitely go for that third again, and that would be an achievement. And then going into the World Cup, this seeding, our results, the big wins we've gotten over New Zealand and, and Australia and the USA, they've earned us this um, uh, p- second seed ranking, which means um, we're going to get a third seed and a fourth seed in our group. We want to get out, out of our group in the World Cup. There's now 16 teams in the Women's World Cup. We want to get into the quarterfinals. So we've got this chance now of of qualifying of being seeded and uh, possibly getting out of the, the, the group. And that would be an incredible achievement in itself, but that's still all to do. There's a lot of rugby still to be played, but we still cannot ignore the year that's just gone and don't let what's happening in the men's game um, sort of hinder what's going on in the women's. Now, having said that, there is still a lot of work to be done to improve the lot of the women's game. I've heard stories of, 
um, top senior women's clubs unable to field teams still now, not having enough players, not having the resources, not maybe having enough support. Um, so there's still work to do there. But um, if there's going to be success on the pitch, that is going to help that. So we need to applaud that and we need to support them as much as we can. So uh, I want to say well done to Scott Beeman and all involved in, in the women's team um, at, over there in Vancouver the past few weeks. It was an amazing uh, display and, uh, and and fair play. And, and long may this uh, success continue and may they get, get better again as, as time goes on. So best of luck to them. Okay. So that's our first article. Now, second um, this is uh, one I've taken from Planet Rugby, as written by Jared Wright, and uh, the headline reads, French Rugby Slam World Rugby's ex- Unacceptable Step Backwards as 20-Minute Red Card Law Edges Closer to Forced Global Trial. Now, this has been an ongoing discussion for a long time in rugby, and it's a serious uh, cause of disagreement between the two hemispheres or more to the point um the the uh, australia new zealand they're the ones that are actually putting up the most um um you know they're supporting this change to a 20 minute red card and um you know just in just in case you haven't heard what this is all about they the, the, in the past like five six seven years they've gotten more strict on head collisions and they've tried to um uh, you know, been stricter on tackles and try try to improve tackle technique in a, in the in the hope of having safer uh, contact on the pitch to prevent more head collisions and concussions and things like that. And one of the things and what one of the results of this is that you often have a clash in the first five ten minutes of a game, which leads to a red card. Which, according to the Australian and New Zealand uh, contingents. Uh, or an, an, a, a body of attitude that's coming from that part of the world is that these early red cards ruin games. And it's like, for me, it's a no brainer. Do we want to ruin the game or do we want to make the game safer? You know, it, and, and does it really ruin the game? And, and who do we put the pressure on to make the game safer? Do we say, Maybe these people in the maybe these people making these dangerous tackles in the early stages of matches, they're part of a team. So if that team needs to be punished and they, you know, we want to put the onus on them not to change the laws. Um, and what happens is, you know, uh, you do a red card offense in the first minute and it's like, it doesn't matter. You, okay. If a yellow card would be 10 minutes and then it's another 10 minutes and then you're back to 15, you're not punished. It's like, um, it, it's, it, it just it doesn't make sense to me. I don't think it makes the game safer. Um, and there's a whole body of opinion. And I think it, it's very important that the French body, the, the league in France, the, 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 the union, the FFR have, have formally formally put out this statement. And that puts them directly at odds with that, uh, with with this um opinion coming from Sanzar. So we're going to see what happens. I don't know what the, if this means. The World Rugby seems to go ahead with this trial that's going to happen in the new year. So we don't know um, how, how this is going to pan out, but this is a strong statement from the French and viva France on that one. So fair play to you. And we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens going down the line. And uh, not unrelated to this is our third article, which comes from The Guardian. Um, this is the, the headline reads lawyer leading brain injury lawsuit under investigation over player recruitment. Now this is fascinating. And, you know, I, I, there's a lot of legal, we, we do a lot of legal stories here and I don't want to get into the nitty gritty cause I am not a lawyer, but this is the case. Uh, these are ongoing cases of players who suffered long-term concussion. And apparently this story suggests that, um, one player, a former Leinster player, by the way, Will Green, um, England international, um, was told to almost lie and sort of, uh, sort of conflate his story, change his story um, to 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 sort of help the case of those bringing these concussion cases. The the um, the quote I've chosen says the case this month has raised questions over how Richard Boardman, a, a lawyer from this legal firm, uh, recruits players to join the lawsuit brought by his firm against world rugby. Now, if this is the case, if this ends up being true, this is going to be a really uh, thorn in the side of the case being brought by people who legitimately have cases to bring. That's the, that's the ultimate shame of this. Um, It's, you know, if, if there's, 
you know, it, it really damages the case if you're actually going and telling people to play around with the truth when they're making their statements about what happened. So, uh, and of course, there's the Leinster involvement in, in that as well. He used to play for Leinster. And, uh, but listen, um, we'll see how these cases go going, going forward. But it's still a reminder that these cases are happening and that there are genuine players who have genuine cases to bring against the sport for the way they've dealt or not dealt with concussion uh, uh, treatments and the, the possibility that concussions happen uh, in the past in, in top level rugby. So that, that also goes back to our last uh, article about uh, that 20 minute red card. So it's, it's an ongoing process in the game and then it's definitely not going away soon. Okay. Our fourth article uh, comes from Rugby Pass, which is, um, we've, we already had one from the official World Rugby site. That's world.rugby. That's where they make their official uh, formal announcements. Now, Rugby Pass is more of a sort of a blog, kind of newsy kind of uh, website um, that is that is owned by World Rugby. So, you know, what what's said here, you know, you, you wonder which is, you know, is it all official statements, just different forums for them to release it? I think it's interesting that they run this site. But anyway, um, the headline reads, ex-Wallaby Rocky Elsom faces international arrest warrants. Now, uh, obviously, no no prizes for guessing why Harpen on Rugby, a Leinster and Ireland website, would be interested in this article. Rocky Elsom, Leinster legend. Um, key, and of course, ironically, last weekend, this story broke just before the game at Croker. Um, and of course, we all remember the game back in 2009. So there's links there. It's just ironic. His name popped up in the news for this. This is something different. This is this is a totally different thing. He's been based in France. He's He's been based in all different places. So there's a lot going on there. I don't get it. I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of the actual cases. Uh, we've talked a lot in these videos about Stuart Hogg and his legal troubles. Again, I don't want to get into the actual case itself. I'm just more in interested how it affects rugby. I mean, Stuart Hogg's case, I was annoyed that there was uh, articles being written that sort of treated the, the case like it was just a nuisance. And it's like, oh, this pesky thing. He's, he's, he's a rugby legend. He's a rugby hero. It's like, no, no, no. He's got this case going on and we can't just ignore that that's happening. Um, so, but I didn't want that, you know, because I was going on about Stuart Hogg all the time, I didn't want it to make it sound like, uh, oh well, this is well, this is what this is a Scottish rugby thing. Something like that couldn't happen in Ireland. No, no, no. There's there's cases all over the world. That's what I'm. That that's the point I'm making. And uh, there's actually been a lot of former Leinster players involved in some sort of legal issues. We just talked about Will Green earlier. Obviously, that's very different. Um, Brendan Mullen. Another former going further back, uh, Leinster and Ireland legend going further back. Um, he's been involved in things. Google that if you want. I'm not getting into that. But there, there's him as well. And now we've got Rocky Elsom. And uh, the quote I've picked from this is, he is currently coaching the modest Catholic University team. That's an interesting way of writing that. The modest Catholic University team, a position he secured on the recommendation of Leo Cullen. Now, that's what he's doing now. He's coaching their SCT team. That's fine, but he's obviously he's got this this legal trouble now. I think it's in France, and um, he's going to have to deal with that. And there's a lot going on there. But I just thought I'd let you know that this came up in the news. Google the details yourself if you want. This was an article by Jeremy Foner in Rugby Pass, and um, that's our fourth article. Okay, finally, our fifth article comes from a website called the Sports Industry Group. I want to give a, a hat tip to uh, Rugby Kino from our Harpen uh, WhatsApp group. He, he shared this with us. And it's more good news about the URC. It's um, basically the viewership figures are just on an upward trend and they just keep going up. And we're now into the fourth season and it's just getting better. I suppose South Africa winning the World Cup didn't hurt. Um, these are South Africa specific numbers, but... They're the numbers we need to be good because South Africa have joined the league and um, we need the game to be successful there. It's a huge market. It's four big uh, individual rugby markets around South Africa, but we need a buy-in throughout the whole country if this is going to work, if this URC project is going to work. And as long as the figures are going up there, it's a good sign for the league as a whole. And the quote from this um, article is from late 2023 to mid 2024, URC broadcast hours surged by 220 hours with 374 additional inserts resulting in heightened exposure for the events. And that's just good news all around. 
doesn't hurt that their teams do well getting into, you know, there's at least one team in every final. There's, um, you know, their, their teams do do well. The Sharks won a European competition. They won the Challenge Cup. Um, so there's success, a lot of success. Their, their teams are doing well in it, but they do need the buy-in. South Africa have their own Curry Cup. They've got their test team doing their own thing. They could, they could just be happy with that, but they've really bought into this URC. And it's not just playing each other. They bought into, you know, there's rivalries forming with Leinster, with Munster. Now Glasgow have gotten in on the mix. There's a lot going on there. They've really bought into this uh, multinational league. You know, they, 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 were, they had been used to super rugby, Australian, New Zealand teams coming over. Now it's coming down from Europe, um, but they've seemed to have bought in and the viewership is increasing and just hope it gets better again. So that's, very good news there. Okay, listen, that's been plenty. That's uh, That completes this week's Front 5. Remember, we do a lot of other regular features on our 80-plus column. You can get it all by just heading over to our website at harpinonrugby.com. We'll be back later in the week with a preview of Leinster's next Interpro over in Galway. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel as well as our other social media platforms. You can find those at linktree slash Rugby. Until next time, stay safe, everyone. Slán.